2008, and it wound all over the place and took up many pages, four pages of which are lost, which cover something really interesting, which we're going to have to find out. So you know how all good stories have a little bit of further questioning. So there is one piece of the puzzle missing, and any other questions that you have, um, I'd be glad to take down and kind of pursue, because um, there probably are some missing pieces. But Carl did a wonderful job. And what I did was read through that and then just put it into story form, because it does go all over the place. <laughs> So uh, this is kind of the story of it. Now, I just love Seaway Hollow. I just love it, okay? And I am the third from the most recent person who lives in it. So I'm really glad Hal's here because his family's been here a lot longer. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just glad to have a witness that I'm doing this in a, in a dignified way. <laughs> All right, so Seaway Hollow, you come down section right here. Make a turn on Seaway Hollow, and here goes Seaway Hollow Road. It ends here, okay, where the mailboxes are. And then there's this little curvy road that goes around a circle and goes down this far. And that is, this is what Seaway Hollow was. Okay, this is the piece that it was. And it's interesting because the beach really is on quite a north and east, it's it's really, it really is more north than you would think. It's it, you can't, it's deceiving, and our particular house is right here, and we look directly. I know it was set up so that the sun comes right across Mount Baker in June. I mean, he set the houses so that they they have their different views. Um, so it's it's really well thought out. Now, and who built that house? Um, we'll get to that. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, okay, so I think we need to start with the, the Samish because over in the um, Anacortes Museum, it has dots on this beach. This is where they summered uh, or did summer um, clamming and drying fish and so forth. And we have been told, uh, you know, not to dig around, not to. Um, and I think there is something with the Samish where we are not supposed to, uh, Mariam told me this the other night, that when they did that new shed, that they were not to dig. And I know that Bobby Spate has said, don't dig around. I find this interesting because in this recent storm, we lost some real <laughs> area of the beach. So if there have been storms in the past, I'm sure the beach has been moving back. So who knows where it used to be in, in uh, that time. But anyway, it's definitely Samish territory. Um, and you've already had a program uh, by Eden uh, Johnson about the logging part. So in, um, and, and I think that's in the museum, the logging section of this history. Because the United States government, so I went to the title office, the same one that Susan went to, and the first record in section 31, which this is, was the U.S. government selling the land to John Edens in 10-20-75, 1875. So, and, and I don't, it's a little hard to tell on these exactly how much. He might have had more, he might have had, but it's basically he bought it. Okay. Uh, and the picture we have right here was from a calendar made by the museum in town, and this shows about 1886, their farmstead. So after it was logged, somewhere there was this little farm. And my guess is, given the way, we don't get as much sunshine as other parts of the island. So if you're going to grow anything, you really need to be in the middle part here, don't you think, where the main sun comes down right in front of where you are. So I think anybody who had farming experience would have put this kind of right in the middle. But insofar as we know, we don't know where that original was. But that shows there was a little farm there. He kept it until, um, he didn't sell the major part of it until uh, 1898. Okay. But in the meantime, for a little while, it was owned by the Big Four Gold Mining Company. <laughs> and, but I think that, or a part of it might have been. I mean, it might have sold a part to them. Okay, and that could have just been a group of investors. Who knows? But um, in uh, 8 it was sold to Isabella Edens. So that was probably a relative. And it included the mineral rights which again is kind of interesting that they were paying attention to that. Then it went into Eden's estate, and then it went through H.J. Merritt, C.H. Sison, or Sisson, I'm not for sure, Pearl Jensen, William Henry Scott, and in 1935, it belonged to J.F. Manners, 
I don't know if this rings a bell with anybody at all. But I think this is very interesting because that's the first time in the title book where it has J.F. Manners off to this side and then it has no second party. Now that would indicate to me that he might have gone bankrupt or something, that it went back to, I don't know what it means. But it's interesting that that's in the middle of the Depression. And then there's nothing else there. It's just a blank. I mean, they don't leave blank spaces, but no other people are mentioned until... Ethel Dorsey and Henry Coburn Allen, who are a couple, uh, buy it in uh, 1944. Mm. Okay, so uh, it, it sat there, it sounds like. Now, the interesting thing is that Dunthorne's wife was Mary Allen. So it seems like it would be a very strange coincidence if Henry Coburn Allen bought it one year before the Dunthorns did and they weren't relatives in some way. So I'm thinking that, and, and these are the four pages that are missing. <laughs> okay. no. How did Dunthorne find the place and from whom did he buy it? Well, he bought it from uh, Henry Coburn Allen, who's the same name as his in-laws, and he bought it at about the same time. Okay, so now let's take a little break here and go back to who Dunthorne was. Okay, because uh, this is kind of lore that goes on, but here's the, this is what Virginia, his daughter-in-law said. And I have to laugh because I'm not for sure we all want our daughter-in-laws to be the ones who report on our lives. But anyway. Uh, okay. But anyway, uh, and this is, uh, you can go back and find this online too. Gordon Dunthorne was born in 1892 in Buckinghamshire, England. And this was about 25 miles southeast of London. Okay. And he graduated from Oxford. He was a World War I veteran. And he went into his father's business of fine prints and maps. Now, he was on business with that company in, um, all right, let's see what date it was here. Hang on just a second. We don't have a date for that. But anyway, he's grown up and he's in San Francisco with his dad's business. And he meets Mary Allen. And they court for 11 days. And she goes back to England with him. And she was born in 1892 in Indianapolis. Okay. Now, this is according to her daughter-in-law, and this is a quote. Mary was very assertive before her time. You didn't mess with Mary. And I don't know she fitted in with British expectations. So the next thing is they decided to move to Washington, D.C. and to have their fine prints and map business there and they had a Federalist house, and they did a good business. Here's a quote. All went well until the stock market crashed in 29. Suddenly, nobody who had been buying prints was buying prints. And so, Gordon put together a lecture on fruit and flower prints and wrote a book. His mother left him a few pounds, and using that, he put together this very beautiful book, Fruit and Flower Prints from the 17th and 18th Centuries and it's used by print dealers the world over as a reference book. And then he went on the lecture circuit. He went all over the USA to garden clubs. They sold the print business, and that, he did that, and then they sold their Federalist house, and they also had a beach house in Maine. So they sold all of those things. Okay, now this is where we do not know, <laughs> but the next time the story picks up, after the four missing pages, she says, finally, they got a bundle. So that's the money they probably used in doing what they did on Guamus. Because they hired bulldozers, and they, the money was there. And here's a picture of the road. So they bought the property. There wasn't a road down. Uh, well, there probably, I mean, the Edens had to get down there some way. But this is, they're bulldozing the road from section down there. Okay. Gordon was handy with property because he had grown up in a place called Ashcroft, outside London. So I went to um, the website just to see if there was an Ashcroft house there. <laughs> this area, have you been, any of you been to Buckinghamshire, England? Uh, <laughs> no. I haven't either. And um, <laughs> it has all of these wonderful, huge, big estate sort of mm. things. <laughs> One of them is now a drug rehabilitation place for women called Ashcroft House. <laughs> So I just wonder if that could not be a repurposed, that's possible, okay. And she says, and it had to be, it was a large piece of property that had to be run, you know. There had to be somebody to drive the car, there had to be housemaids, there had to be gardeners, and he could see how a spread was managed. And Mary could manage anything. 
Well, he said that at the end of World War II, she should have been assigned to help clean up, get it all organized. <laughs> she fretted because there was no place to go out to dinner on Guaymas. She hated to cook, but she never made a bad meal in her life. She was just such a perfectionist in that way. Okay. So then she says, they realized that this Seaway Hollow on Guaymas Island should look the way they built it. They knew exactly what they were doing. They had the cottages. They were not meant to be houses. They were meant to be cottages. Did they call it Seaway? They, call, uh, they called it Seaway Hollow, I think. I had a feeling they needed to make some money, and they were very careful to keep the cottages far apart. And I think this is one of the beautiful things about it, is that there are 12 lots, essentially, and each one you can hardly see from the other, or if your view is different, they just each feel different. It's, it's really well laid out. Um, there's no stacking up houses. You had privacy down there. Okay, and um, so we'll get back to this now in a minute, but now I have to get Virginia Reed, the one who's being interviewed, into the story, because this begins to all fit together. She was the daughter of William Reed, who was Murray Reed's brother. So she's Jane Reed's niece, okay? And uh, he was born in DuPont, Indiana in 1901. He was a professor in the classics department at the University of Washington. He purchased a vacation cabin. The same year Dunthorne purchased this, he purchased the cabin from Pat, and you've got to help me pronounce this, S-V-E-R-R-E, -E, Aristod, it's fair. Okay. It's and you know where that one is, and that's in your, I think that's in the calendar. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So they had rented that cabin, and he was saying to the people who owned it, Sir, I love this place. Would you be willing to sell it? And they said, $1,000 is yours. And so <laughs> she was a sophomore in high school. So she's out here in the summertime, the same summer that the Dunthorns have just bought this and have two college-age sons, <coughs> okay? So she's a friend of Dolly Lewis, of mm -hmm. Lewis Lane, okay? And Dolly Lewis tells her it's fine. She can come down and wash her hair because Dolly Lewis has running water and they don't have running water. And you know, a teenage girl getting to wash her hair under running <laughs> water. So she said, what a treat. I'd put my head under a tap and get it really clean. And it was those little kindnesses that you remember about a person. And then Judy Krieger was another friend. And then she noted that, you know, they were from Everett, the telephone people from Everett. And they're related to, and then she tells who they're related to. So Judy Krieger said to Virginia, why don't we walk down the beach and meet the Dunthorns? <coughs> okay, and that's how yeah, they met, yeah. and they got married in 1947. Okay, now, in the meantime, so this Wait, is Virginia Mary Virginia Reed, who's Jane's niece, yeah. married the Gordon Dunthorne's son, Stephen, oh, okay. and they have two sons, Stephen and Peter, and Peter never comes up in this. It's a, they never mention him, so uh, that's kind of interesting because Jane said he lives in Cedro Woolley and he's an artist. So okay. I would like to go talk to him. I'd really like to ask him some questions. Oh, um, I, one of the, is it one of is one of their sons the one that died young? Yes, I'm getting to that. Okay. Yes, coming up. That's the one who just married Virginia in 1947. Oh. Oh, okay. oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm, please excuse me. Please, no, stop that. Okay, I'm, I won't ask any sorry questions. About that. I no, got we'll you mixed get, up. We'll get to this in just a minute. Okay. okay. The jury will disregard yeah, those Disregard reports. that remark. <laughs> okay, now, when, by the time they got here, where are my little things? What he had done, what Gordon had done, is there was a old cabin that was down here, and she said they spruced it up. Okay, that's going to become the Griggs's property now. Okay. There was this one that you see all the time in things that you have a picture of. It's like that old blacksmith shop. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was right here. And Stephen and um, Virginia lived in it for a while and they rented it out to people also. So this is really old. In this place, there was a barn like this. And it says on the back of this picture, this was what we had to start with, September 1943. Now, according to the title office, they haven't bought it yet. But that's what it says here. So that's right here. Okay. And there wasn't any there wasn't any other building on the property. So he built uh, Stephen and uh, Virginia. Uh, where's that? Let me see this in just a second here. They started building this one, which is still here. Okay. And she's going to give credit to these two men. 
and say that George Kingston is the one who really knew how to build and helped by Tony Nasser. So they built those. Nasser. Okay. Nasser. Yeah. Say it for me again. Nasser. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, down here there was one Ada Hartman. Right here there was one Fran McCord. And these two are still on Becky's property. Mm -hmm. Okay. That are right there. So those guys were there. And then Ours, the one that we now have, was, let me, I gotta get myself oriented here just a second. I'm sorry to take a minute. Yeah, we're right here. Yeah, there we are. Okay, was there one under your house? Before no. You put, no, I, I didn't think so. Okay, so. Mary Pease's was right here. Okay, the Marlins was right there. And uh, we've already gotten one right up here. And then there was, later on there's one. Well, they, they didn't build that one. So anyway, he went to work building this with these men and there's a picture of Gordon right here holding a dog. This is the only picture we have of him in this group of pictures. And, and uh, Virginia gave all these to Carl. Okay, So they went around building these and this is ours when we bought it and it really and it had not been, it had, this little piece had been oh, added but you okay. get the idea of the shake roof and, and the cedar the sidings. This is one that was built. Wow. And they, are, they were each different and they were very um, whole, I mean, <laughs> uh, you can help on this sort of, but I mean, <laughs> yes, I mean, bad pipes going underneath and, and uh, bad, uh, the sink pours out sort of into the ground. I mean, I mean, they were very, they had lots of personality, but lots of cracks for mice and things like that, but lots of personality. So, so there, so you um, marked all 12 lots? Um, well, let's come. I'll, I'll talk about them, and then we'll see if they're. So in you there. have a house there. That's. Uh, wait, well, I put it in the wrong place. That's my fault. Here we go. It should be up. This is the one. I put it in the wrong place. It's over. Let's right. see that right down. Yes. Oh, my fault. Yeah, there we go. No, that's okay. Yeah, right back. No, no, no. <laughs> no I'm sorry. <laughs> I keep, thank you, Val. Thank you. Okay, so now we're back to Seaway Hollow. So he he was building those. Now he rented these out, and he rented out most of them. It turns out to people who were professors at the U. Okay. So, um, so and this is now in the late '40s. Okay. So is this Dunthorne? This is Dunthorne. Okay. Uh -huh. And Mary and, and Gordon Dunthorne, and they lived. They fixed up that one that looked like a barn, mm -hmm. so that it looked like this, and it's still there. So this is how they fixed it up, okay, and it's still there. Okay, so the log, this is quoting her now, the log cottages were built by Tony Nasher, a retired railroad man, and a really, really important person besides Tony Nasher was George Kingston. I hope you have lots of information on George Kingston. He's an Indian, you know. He lived in a little cottage right off the ferry landing, one, two, three, four up. And I can't remember his wife, but George was absolutely central to building that house because he knew how to do it. And Steve and I went up in the woods and cut the wood for our log house and snaked it out with a John Deere <coughs> tractor, and I helped. That was before we were married. He took a year off school. Before we were married, and I went up and helped skin the logs. You can picture me peeling the logs. And the house went up, and it was very, very breezy. And we tried to put oakum in the spots, but finally we paneled one of the rooms. And we had a big wood-burning stove and a fireplace, and that was it. That was heat. And it took a lot of nerve to take a shower. But we did, <laughs> but we did have running water. You can see how Carl really got her going on this. Yeah. It's so good. So Virginia and Steve then, they did that cabin. Then they rented it out, and they went back to the UW, and they finished up whatever their studies. And they had their first son, Robert. Okay, and Robert was the son who had uh, the disease that you age prematurely, and he died uh, when he was about nine years old. And then, uh, so then their second son uh, was um, Peter, and Peter was born in 1951. Okay, and their two sons were playmates of Glenn and Arne. And she said that Jane Veal and her boys, and Helen Vonnegut and her boys, would go to the beach, these the three mothers and the six, and they'd go down here to the beach west of the ferry, and they'd spend the afternoon watching the children play. And Helen put together a little kindergarten at the hall for the little boys. So I mean, just it's just really her sweet. Doing that. Yeah. Okay. And then she says, but much of the life centered around food <laughs> and the natural setting at the hollow. It was a feast, quotes, a feast all the time. And then she lists the old cherry trees. 
So you see, the Edens could have put out the cherry trees, yeah. mm -hmm. and then they were all, they're huge, and they're still there. Some of them are still there. Kathy, is yes. Helen Walters' wife? Hel yes, Monica. Monica. Yes, yes. Monica. Uh -huh. and they're going to come up again in a little bit here. Okay, and she says there were many apple trees. They had vats of applesauce to freeze, uh -huh. and some of those trees are still there. Filberts, there are 51 of those, okay. Green gauge plums, yellow by August, and those are still there, okay. And boysenberries and raspberries. Does and someone still prune the trees? Nobody does anything with them. They don't spray them or anything, and they just produce, and there are no insects. And there are lots hmm. of, you, are, are, do you think? Yeah. Well, you prune your trees. Yeah, but. the ten caterpillars have discovered uh, all the trees. Uh, yeah, they yeah. discovered everything. Yeah, that's true. And ate everything. <laughs> then she mentions raspberries, and she said Buzzy Reinhardt from North Beach would come down with cream to put on the raspberries, so he would row the boat down, <laughs> and they'd get cream and put it on the raspberries. <laughs> so, so that was Claudia's brother. I don't know. Buzz Ashback. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it was her a, younger brother, right? Buzz. Yeah, I think Buzzy. so. Yeah. So you, I mean, just I love it the way it all fits together. <laughs> all right, they had lots of strawberries. The vegetable garden was between the beach and the pond, and it was fertilized with kelp. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they had potatoes, <coughs> peas, broccoli, spinach, leeks, white asparagus, midget corn, scarlet runner beans. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they made the rose garden, and they had lots of zinnias just for flower arrangements. Wow. So they mm -hmm. really worked. I mean, <laughs> mm -hmm. all right. Now the family had walkie-talkies. There were no telephones, mm -hmm. and they had walkie-talkies, mm -hmm. and they would call each other about the wildlife. So one would call and say, "The great blue heron is eating a big garter snake," <laughs> and um, they talked about the crows. They talked about the wood ducks, which I've never seen a wood duck there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they talked about all the different bird life, and they talked about the crabs, which are still there. And according to Virginia, the pond was already there when Dunthorns bought the property, that he did not touch the pond. Mm -hmm. But they did bulldoze driftwood on the beach to make it look more attractive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they've always you know, kind of said he dug the pond, but she says, no, no I don't know. Mm -hmm. And she has pictures of where the pond froze solidly in 1948. So that's kind of interesting, too, in terms of weather. And then at that time, they dug the well, which continues to be the source for all of us who live there. Oh, my. Okay. Yeah. Now, kind of interesting because Howard Tuttle was renting one of these places in the summer, and he loved it so much. And his, his, the families, the wives and the children, sort of Kennedy family style, <laughs> would come up and the men would be back at work in the city and come up for the weekends. So Howard Tuttle was coming up to see his family that was renting one of these little ones without electricity or anything, just one of those little tiny ones. And he stopped at the title office in Mount Vernon and he wanted to see if there was any adjacent property he could buy. And he found the piece of property right over here where there's a point of very solid rock. Mm -hmm. This is all low beach, and it, mm -hmm. it erodes a little bit, uh, the low beach. But there's a huge rock that is <laughs> really solid. And he found that piece of property. And so he copied the deed, and he copied the assessment, which was $4,800. And he sent it to the people in California and said, I want to buy the land. Sign on this line if you'll sell it to me. And they wrote back and said, you really, you probably don't want to buy this because there's no access to the property. There's no electricity. There's no water. And he said, yes, I do want to buy it. <laughs> and so that's how Howard Tuttle came into the picture. And then he and Dunthorne, uh, he was a lawyer. And so he helped Dunthorne uh, when he started selling the property and getting easements mm -hmm. and all that. And there's a lot in the, in the book here about easements on everything because the Tidelands are a part of the property. And so there are easements for roads. Then there are easements for the electricity when it came in in 54. And so there are all kinds of back and forths on property. Okay. And now, so here we, and we're almost finished. Um, here we go. So, um, Dunthor, so then uh, they sold this one right down here went to Annette Eden and Maud Henderson, and they were related to John Eden. So it got back to that family. Mm -hmm. And today, that, so that only went into, that went into their, to Maud Henderson, and then Maud Henderson sold it 
just let me get this a minute, because it's so interesting how these properties have hardly changed hands. I mean, that's what's really interesting about it, I think. So in Maud Henderson bought it in uh, 4752, and uh, then it was sold to Peter, John, and Eden, the three children of uh, a Griggs family, in 81. So this has only had three people, I mean, then they're all in the family. So who had it from the 50s to 81? Uh, Maud Henderson and Isabel Griggs. Oh, is it? Okay. Isabel was in there in the middle. Okay. And then the Marlins, which mm -hmm. you've mentioned, and you know, uh, this is their place right here. It went from Marlins in, nine, in 1951 to Chapels in 75 to Callens in 04. So it's only had three people. And they've renovated it along the way. But I mean, just three people. And, um, okay, and Otis and Mary Pease, that still belongs to the Pieses. That's this one right here. It's still their family, okay? Um, the people named Tom Wendell bought it, this one in 56, and we bought it in 85. So it's two people. Um, the Ericsons bought theirs in 59, and they had rented it before then quite a bit. <coughs> Sorry, thank you. Thank you, Ericsons. There we go. Okay, and, uh, and it's all still their family, okay? The Rooks family in 60... There you are. Okay, good. And um, and so and this was the time then when they formed Seaway Hollow. So your family must have probably was in on the forming of Seaway Hollow. Okay, and um, so there we go. Fifty nine was Seaway Hollow. Okay, and then um, the property. Uh, uh, what's uh, Becky Rodman is right here in the middle. Okay, nobody had lived in the middle. There hadn't been anybody there at all. That was all Dunthorne still. And, and again, the property's kind of mixed up because some of it they gave to Stephen and to, um, uh, or, or anyway, Stephen and Virginia, it's in their name. And some of it's in Gordon's name. Okay, and they sold, they had a, a garage with a guest house over it, and they sold that to Bobby Spaeth. So that becomes another piece of property. And it, was, it still kind of looks like a garage in a guest house. And it's right, I'm going to put it in the right place, right on the bend on the road right there. Okay, so these, Mrs. Marlin was getting older. And she was by herself. She was widowed then. And so she had a friend, and I think I'm saying it right, Rustad, R-U-S-T-A-D. Mm. Okay, and so she wanted, she was hoping that the Rustads could live nearby and help. So they bought this piece that's the middle part. Mm -hmm. That then went to a family, and we're going to pronounce. Was it place? Had, had, I know. Okay. So in so they the Rustad stayed there as long as their health lasted from sixty three to eighty three, and then it was sold to a family that uh, were heartily disliked for not fitting in at all, <laughs> and then it was sold to the Rodmans in eighty nine. So this is Becky's right there. Okay. And then the Ramseys bought the Dunthorns place in sixty three, mm -hmm. and that's still in their family. And John Spaeth was 67 when he bought, so that's still in their family. And then down on this end, Robert Stockton, Ralph Stockton, yeah. bought it from, um, I can't remember who her name, Ada Hartman, I think it was Ada Hartman. And he bought it, and then it went from Ralph Stockton to um, Bob Bradley. And then Stockton owned up here, mm -hmm. up in here, and then he sold it to, um, just a second, um, to the Morris family, to David Morris in 71. And then there was a little bit of readjustments that went on. And Wallace, John Wallace, moved in here because he got some when the place, when the uh, Rustads left. He got some of the Rustads sort of, and it all kind of went around like that. So anyway, the interesting thing is that these are still the same people. And um, I think that's very interesting. Okay, so he sold it off like that. Okay, about this time, Mary, who had always been a very anxiety-ridden person, got Alzheimer's and became very difficult in many ways, according to her daughter-in-law. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of things, attitudes that she had that were just my not my attitudes at all. And I had to bite my tongue a lot. And she was not terribly fond of Helen Vonnegut, the girl mm -hmm. that Colonel married. She didn't want Colonel to marry Helen. So Helen and Colonel built their own house. They had been living in that log cabin. But they, and they went and built the tower house. Okay? And then, um, uh, it was called... Who was Mary again? Mary? Mary Dunthorne. She's Dunthorne's wife. So Mary Dunthorne. Gordon's, Gordon's wife. wife. Oh. Who's Mary? Uh -huh. Bill Reed's. So, what? Bill, Bill Reed's daughter. Is that right? Bill Reed's is Virginia. 
Okay. Yeah, she's okay. the daughter-in-law who's okay. telling oh, all this. Oh, but oh, Mary okay. is the one who got all. Those are the ones that went to England, but didn't. That's right. She didn't fit in there. That's exactly <laughs> right. Okay. So anyway, at that point, Colonel went to Bellingham, got his teaching certificate, came back and taught school on Guaymas. Mm -hmm. So that's oh. that family. And the reason the Vonnegut's were here was he yeah. was a friend of Mary's from Indianapolis. Oh. And of course, that's the cousin of Kurt Vonnegut. Okay. Now, on March now, and this is here we are because now it goes away quickly. On March the twenty third, nineteen fifty three, Steve Dunthorne got polio. That's the husband of Virginia, the one who's telling this, the son of Gordon. Okay. And again, Peter has never been mentioned in all of this. It's just as if Stephen is the only son they have. So I have no idea what that's about. He was working at the Far West Fisheries in Anacortes. His first job he had when he came, when we moved here that December, was to work at the Anacortes American. Wally Funk and John Weber owned it, and they had known Stephen at the U. And so they gave him a new job at the newspaper, which wasn't going to turn out to anything, and everybody knew it. <laughs> and so we were living on practically nothing. But we had all that garden produce and wonderful chicken eggs. See, Gordon fed the chickens kale. And you have never seen such golden egg yolks in your life. <laughs> anyway, we were living on no money, but who needed it? So then he went to work for Far West Fisheries in the job of a fish tender. <coughs> then they asked if he wanted to work in the office. That was where he was working when he got polio. And that just wiped him out. He went to the Anacortes Hospital. They transferred him right away to St. Joseph's in Bellingham, and he was one miserable cookie because he had acute anterior polio, my lead, how do you say my lead? My lead. Yeah, my okay. which meant that it got every, he was lucky that it didn't. He didn't need to be on an iron line. His hands were somewhat affected, but not critically affected, and he had torso problems in his neck. He came out of that using leg braces, braces and crutches. And then she, it's just so touching because she says, forever after. Just two words. Mm -hmm. We walk, were off Guaymas, and Steve was able to go back to work at the cannery. When in 1960, the cannery decided to consolidate its business down to Seattle, Steve got a better job at the art department at the UW, which was just a gift. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. On the same day, I got a job at one of the elementary schools. It was just meant to happen. So we moved in August of 1961 to Bellevue and have been in that same house ever since. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Mary and Gordon went to Exeter House uh, on Seneca in Seattle. And, Mary, and Virginia says, it was high time they left the island. <laughs> she was hard to deal with, and Gordon, you know Gordon seems so indestructible. I think it broke their heart when Steve got polio, because they had always worked for, this will be for Steve, and he will be able to handle this. Well, when Steve obviously couldn't, we had to move off the island. There went the dream. But it was interesting that Gordon was thinking ahead, and this is what endears her so much. The common knowledge was that he wasn't too savvy about business or anything like that. He never talked about it or anything. But Mary was the one who kept track of things. Well, don't kid yourself. He was conferring with the people at the People's Bank in Anacortes and was beginning to salt away a little something in stocks, thinking ahead for Steve. And he was doing that very early when he saw what was happening. And none of us knew that. It didn't turn out until, you know, much, much later that he'd been doing that. So I am very grateful for that because that is what is making it nice for me right today. And she's over in Lacan. <clears throat> I'm very grateful for that gift. <clears throat> so Wonderful. I just think this shows what an interview can do. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. So thank you all for listening. Well, I just think yeah. there's yeah. 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 too much. Hmm. And that's what we're trying to do. Okay, now I think you should say anything that any holes that you sense. <laughs> no, I've learned a lot. I'm really glad you're here. <laughs> um, the Vonnegut's, I think Ian can correct us, but I think their house is over the house that's now Sal Werner's mm -hmm. is I think right here. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody's interested. Mm -hmm. The story Sal tells is that Walter was a prisoner of war. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. in Japan and, and came mm -hmm. back from the war and bought that property. And I went to school with Ken, their son, mm -hmm. their youngest son, oh, the Bonnegut son, at the schoolhouse here on, on Guimas. Mm -hmm. And another thing I just have learned in the last couple of years, um, so this was the Ericsons, and Erickson, the old Eric, Erickson bought up a lot of the land that I think on this side of uh, 
Seaway Hollow Drive. And so, and then he had this piece of property too that goes back to Section mm -hmm. Road. And his daughter, who when I was her age, I knew as Heidi mm -hmm. Erickson, but she's now Mariam Schutz. Mm -hmm. And Mariam um, is a cousin of Becky Rodman, mm -hmm. which is probably how Becky came here. And in turn, uh, Becky, I think, is a sister of Holiday. Mm -hmm. Holiday, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's a very small world. <laughs> yeah. Um, I well, I did a thing on polio uh, because of the dun thorns. I had there were three people. I had got polio, and uh, Steve got polio, and an, another woman. I forgot her name, but here was some archaic ways that it was treated. Oh, yes. And I'll hand that around. There's. Iron lung. That was yeah, the iron that lung. Was just, I dreaded that. <laughs> a little kid, you just dreaded that. 